Best short films for lifelong learning, recommended by teachers for teachers. This is Short Films Teachers Love, with your host, Richard Lee. One of the films that absolutely took me by storm was a short film by Bruce Connor called Report, and it was about the assassination of JFK. I was on Simmons Freeway earlier, and even the freeway was jam-packed with spectators waiting their chance to see the president as he made his way towards the trade mart. It, it, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street, there by the Simmons Freeway. Several police officers are rushing up the hill at this time. Stand by just a moment, please. And then, of course, it had other news, really, shots of JFK and, and Jackie getting off the plane, Jackie in a little pink suit and all this, although it was a black and white film. So there were all these sorts of things going on in this very short film that presented a tumultuous event in, in a tumultuous way, but it was both exploratory, experimental, avant-garde, and incredibly exciting, incredibly exciting to me as a young filmmaker. I had not thought until I saw that film, that a film could be so short and so rich in its associations. Perhaps we should move then to the, the sort of historical context of this. And it's interesting you've started with the, you know, talking about your work in the 60s. And that, to me, I mean, you know, I was, I was born in 1970. I was born at the time when the 70s was kind of exploding yes, right. with all this new film yeah. stuff. We all got started in the 60s, but I don't think I flowered as a filmmaker until the 70s, 80s and 90s. I think my best work probably came in my life when I was in my 40s. And I'm now talking about films like, um, say, Melakuta Stampede, Journey to the End of Night, and my triptych film, and, who's a, and Fear of the Dark. I made those films in the early 80s, but my what gave rise to my films in the early 80s was everything I went through in 60, 70, and the early 80s. They didn't come out of nowhere. All of those films came out of what I had absorbed in that period. Now, they also included absorption from another source, which I haven't mentioned. And that is that I was completely bowled over by Chris Marker's film, La Jetée, when I was about a 20-year-old filmmaker. On the 10th day, images begin to ooze like confessions. A peacetime morning. A peacetime bedroom. A real bedroom. Real children. Real birds. Real cats. Real graves. With La Jete, I see it as a narrative film. I see it also as a version of science fiction. It is a, it is a fantasy, as you said. It's a, but it is a fantasy film within the orbit that I would call the ambit of science fiction. It's a film that's got all of those qualities involved in it, but it also has a very beautifully constructed audio track, which most people probably don't focus on in their judgment of the film. But for me, I, I think the film has a very brooding, um, elegant soundtrack, which is absolutely perfect for that film. It's a major partner in the film. Now, I don't know if you felt that when you were watching the film. Did you feel that it was a very musical soundtrack? Yeah, yeah I did. I, I at least picked up on that much. <laughs> I, and I, Look, and I did pick up on a few things. Um, but one of the... And, and I just want to actually jump back to the other film, the first uh, report that we talked about, um, yeah. and pick up on this idea of um, the tension between obscurity and clarity. And, and I think... And I like the, this word you use, poetry. These are poetic films. How, how much should it be clear and how much should it be obscure all right well for me uh that is that is a balancing act for every film that it's, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about documentaries or feature films drama or whether you're talking about avant-garde poetic films uh the question is for me when films are so spelt out that it's that there is no mystery and there is no working out i really love films that make you do the homework yourself 
This is Frank film. It's the story of my life from the beginning up to the present and 70, into the future. 69 of uh, perhaps considering the speed of it, I should call it a uh, fast Frank film. 65. Basically, what it is is that I've been saving images 62, for the past five or six years. All the things 60, that appeal to me because I like them, 58, and sometimes I like them just because they look nice, and other times 55, I like them because they mean something special 53, to me. 52, uh, I'll start at the beginning. I was 50, born 49, in Key West, Florida. 48, my father was in a naval station there. 46, and 45, uh, I was the first of five kids. September 6, 1944, was, uh, me. Me. I guess Moi. a good time to be born. Morris. The war was almost Francis over. Peter was First of all, it is an account of his life up to the point of the release of the film. So he, up to the point of completing that film, he's made a film that is a document of his life and his growth as a human being and his fascination with certain obsessive subjects, including the obsessive subject of himself being Frank. It also includes the, the analysis of his obsession with everything to do with the letter F because his name starts with F. So he goes through every word in the dictionary that starts with F. And he juxtaposes those words with, with the account of his life. So if you're listening to it, aside from looking at those images, you ha actually have to try and make sense out of the duality of this conflicting thing of these words that start with F and him telling the story about the events in his life. And that's actually a, a very big intellectual challenge to put those things together in a meaningful way in your mind when they are so disparate. But then they're no more disparate than both of them working against the images or the images working against them. But the images themselves, uh, I don't call it fast cutting, I call it a cascading collage. And it's a cascading collage which is made up of um, somebody using basically a single frame animation technique on a Bolex type camera. It's like a blossoming of ideas. A blossoming of ideas yeah. and a blossoming of images. And now I just wanted to get a little bit more about you. You continue to, there's something about you that is teacher like. You, you like sharing your passion with people. Tell me a bit about that and what, what you do with that and why that's there and where it's going. Well, it's problematic because as you know, I ran a session for people up here in film uh, and I also ran music for beginners. And some of these people are really deeply interested and some of them are not. I have the ladies in the film study group Beautiful ladies, beautiful bloody ladies, and they're all in their 60s, and some are older. One was older, quite a bit. She's in her mid-80s now. And some of them were really, really keen on seeing the films. But then I had a policy where I, I said to them, I don't want you to read up on the films before you see them, and I don't want you to read up on the films before we discuss them. And then they would do both of these things, I'd say, I'm here to get your opinion in reaction to a film that I want you to nut out for yourself. I don't want you to pre-digest the film, reading some critic's response to say, oh, this is a heap of shit, you know, you shouldn't bother going to see this. Oh, this is a great masterpiece, right? I'm not doing that. I'm not teaching them it's a heap of shit or a great masterpiece. Okay, here's a film. I'm interested to know how you're going to react to it. Then if they have difficulties reacting to it, we talk it through. We get each person's opinions of how they reacted to it. Then I say, well, you might be surprised to know that some critics think this is the best film that was ever made and some think it's the worst, right? Now go and read them. But I don't want you to have started before you watched the film seeing that they were saying these things about Yeah, okay. I couldn't stop them doing that. To me, there's something about art that connects with us that has, you know, I call it an emotional truth for want of a better word. There's something that we find and appreciate in art that is connected to our lives that somehow rings true and that's why we make films and that's why we love to share the films that we like to share. Is that a fair way? Is that no, a way? because I'll tell you why. There are, there are films that obviously very much do touch you in one way or another that you can say, yes, I have a correlative to that out of my life. But there are others that have none at all, and they are only in the realm of imagination. So in other words, I'm not going for this notion of yours about truth. But if I look at a film like Fellini's La Strada, I know, yeah, there is a truth in this film. There is a, ver there is a, a veracity in this film and in, in, uh, in Bresson's film uh, Diary of a Country Priest uh, and in Pater Pan Charlie by Sadi Ajit Ray. These are films that have great 
veracity. They strike a, a chord in your being that you say, yeah. So that when in uh, La Strada, where the, t- the character jo- uh, Jocelyna dies, after the angel character played by Richard Basehart has been killed by the Anthony Quinn character, who is Zampano. And when Zampano <laughs> goes and lies on the beach and basically say, what have I done to deserve being this person? I didn't mean to be like this. It's terrifying. And I think you don't... You don't have to have lived through something like that yourself to know his his agony. And yet he's a monster. He is a monster. (laughs) And then, so, okay, I'm a bit lost now. Keep going. I can take more before. To listen to the full conversation, go to the audio version on SoundCloud or iTunes. To get more ideas for your teaching, join our new Facebook group today. All links in the notes below.